to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it. We have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to a well-designed business. We all know the value of relationships in business, right? If you've listened to the show for any length of time, you've heard this emphasized over and over because it really is that important. However, I'm still always interested in learning the how, how different people are going about building solid relationships in business that make a difference to both their business and their lives. My guest today, Rama Dandamudi, is someone who believes in relationships. Rama is here today to talk about how relationships as well as predictability, okay, and he's here to tell us that predictability ultimately matters more than pricing. You'll hear in his conversation, the way you create predictability is by focusing on relationships. Now, before I tell you a little bit more about Rama, let's take a moment to talk about relationships and how and why attending Luann Live this or this November in Orlando 2023 can impact your business specifically through relationship building. Okay. By now, I think it goes without saying that an event of mine, at any event of mine, you are going to get business advice, strategies, and resources to create more profit in your business, right? So that's good. But then there's this relationship component. This is also a very specific deliverable of Luann Live. It's a deliverable that I promise to you. Okay. Unlike other events that you might attend, going to market, KBiz, or other industry conferences, Luann Live delivers on this relationship component. And you know why? It's because we are together the entire time. And I mean together. When Christy and I take the stage at nine o'clock each morning, we are with you until the very end of the day through the keynotes, the panels, and the tons of talking together as a group all day long on all the topics, process and systems, branding, managing your life and your business goals, licensing, working with builders, all of it. Okay. Now here's the thing that happens when you are together for the whole day, meaning the meals, the parties, all of it. It means you get tons of opportunity to actually set the foundation for the possibilities of meaningful friendship. Okay. It's not, oh, you know, I've been wanting to meet Nancy Ganskow for forever and I know she's here and I saw her on stage, but you know what? Then she was gone. Mm -mm. This is, we are there. We are there. And it's also, we are there when you just by happenstance meet a fellow, a colleague at, you know, over breakfast or over lunch or over a coffee. And you think, wow, I really connected with them. And then sometimes when that happens at market, you just never see them again, but not at Luann Live. You can walk up to that person again because we're all there all day together. Okay. So this is the thing. It's when you have the opportunity over three or four days to nurture the friendships that spark you, that's how they lead to the support, the collaborations, all the things that will help you be the best business owner you can be in the future, right? How do you think every co-author in both Power Talk Friday books came to be? How do you think every instructor at Lou University came to be? Every single collaboration that I have started with a relationship. This is why I go to all the events in the industry. So I too can enhance my knowledge, but also so I can build my relationships, which in turn build the opportunities for both me and that other person. Okay. I say, come to Luann Live for the knowledge. Leave with that and so much more. 
You just never know what idea, what person, what connection will have a dramatic impact on you and your business. You know which opportunity is guaranteed not to benefit you in some way? The one you don't take. Get in the room. Level up. Join me this November 2023 in Orlando. Go to LuannLive.com to learn more. And by the way, VIP is three quarters sold out. So if you want to be part of the VIP experience, do not hesitate. (laughs) Decide now. Do now. Okay. All right. Now back to Rama. Rama is a Chicago-based entrepreneur with more than two decades of experience creating and managing businesses within the residential design industry. He is the president and founder of 210 Design House, a lifestyle showroom offering a curated collection of internationally acclaimed high-end interior products. He has spent the last two decades not only designing, but also developing partnerships with international luxury brands and bringing them to the U.S. market. I have to say, too, definitely check out his portfolio. Holy cow. (laughs) Okay. So I'm excited to introduce Rama to you. Let's hear what he has to say about predictability being the cornerstone of his success. Hi, Rama. Thanks so much for joining me on a well-designed business today. Well, thank you for having me, Luann. Happy to be here. Well, I'm excited to get into this interview with you, Rama. First of all, I just have to tell everyone listening, they've got to go and look at your website and look at the work that you and your team produce. It is legitimately, we we throw the word around um, luxury uh, around quite a bit. Um, And what's so funny is, I'm going to just tell you what happened when I was watching the video that you have on your website, which shows... um, the place that you do business out of, your three-story studio. Um, I'm not a person who literally has it as an aspiration to, I guess what I would, you know, really just very frankly say, convert my living environment to match what I actually create from a standpoint of business or um, let's just be honest, wealth, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just not a things girl. I'm not a you know, it's not about the pretty to me. I like it to be attractive. I like it to be comfortable. Um, but I don't often, as much as I'm in this world and I see all the beautiful things designers create, I very rarely have that, ooh, I would like to do the, have that or I would like to put that into my home or design. And I was like, oh, you're missing the boat on how beautiful things could <laughs> yeah. be around you. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you think I've done 900 interviews with interior designers and I had that looking at your website, I was like, oh, <laughs> so hats off to you, sir, well, with what you're creating, your team is creating over there. Well, thank you. This has actually come an evolution of 25 years. So even for us, this space, fortunately, we found this building five years ago and it was an old um, law office that when you walked in, but it's a classic brick and timber Chicago building. So we had the opportunity to gut the building and actually do what we always want to do. So yeah. it's kind of a great yeah. opportunity for us. It's impressive. It really is Thanks. impressive. So, okay. So let's get to the meat of the interview here. You on your intake form said a sentence on there. And I, you know, listeners hear me say this all the time is there's always this one line that I'm like, Oh, that's the one. That's what I want to talk about. And you said that, you know, basically you didn't say the whole sentence in order to be successful or whatever, but assuming that's the truth is that predictability is actually more important than pricing when it comes to crafting the success of your projects in your design firm. So I'm waiting to hear what that means to you. My brain goes to all these things, but I've waited for the interview to hear the answer. Well, I think, you know, it's kind of actually got more accentuated during COVID if you think about what we just went through. And part of it has been, you know, we do multi-housing. We do single family homes. And so we do some very high-end penthouses. At the same time, we're doing, we just finished a 100-story building at the St. Regis in Chicago. So, All during the process, I think part of it has always been designed. People draw. People are very creative. That's fantastic. But can you execute on time? And execution on time and execution on budget has become very important. And I think it's more important. So so when we're talking to developers or clients and designers, the predictability premium is that, is it just a value engineering for price? Or do you want to make sure you're dealing with somebody who can actually deliver on time? And I was actually reading the Financial Times 
I was somewhere in Europe and the word came up when our, weirdly, our ex-mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, was talking at an event as the ambassador to Japan. And he brought this up and he was talking in terms of changing supply chains out of certain countries that weren't reliable and moving them to more reliable areas. And that was a context he brought it in. And I think we're many times competing with firms that don't have the track record or haven't delivered or can't deliver or have supply chains that are, you know, not stable. And so we've been kind of bringing this up to say, guys, one of the things you have to look at in your project is the predictability part, because it's great to have fantastic design. Uh, if it doesn't show up on time, or if it does show up, it's not reliable, or it has to be redone, I think you just lose everything. And I think it just, I think the clients are unhappy. And if you're doing a development, your developers can't close. It's, it's, it's a big financial strain. I mean, we did 116 containers, 40 foot containers into St. Regis during the pandemic. I was a 120 building. That was 38,000 cabinets, you know, 400 sliding glass doors. And so we kind of point there and say, guys, we were on time during this entire process. And the building got done and people moved in. And that kind of predictability, we think, should have a higher premium over almost most other things you're looking at when you're looking at your project. It just headaches, you know. I mean, you could have a great design. If it's not executed on time, you have a really angry client. And we've all been through this. So I think we've been trying to push. I think even for design, community hasn't really looked at this more carefully. I think COVID kind of really opened it up where we had an event at the showroom uh, about three, four months ago. There were about 12 interior designers in. And we're just talking about kind of a roundtable discussion. And almost every single one of them said, hey, we have super long lead times. We're not sure, you know, because of supply chain issues. And then we're kind of talking to them saying, guys, it's not that everything is bad. The choice of your vendor is not good. And so that's the disservice to your client because I think in the past, maybe you were able to, wasn't as important or wasn't as brought up because supply chains were much more robust and a little bit delayed here and there didn't make a difference. But I think especially during COVID, it kind of exposed who had the redundancy in their system and who didn't. And if folks were caught, really kind of ended up suffering. Whereas if you had a good system in place, it did, you know, kind of went through the whole pandemic without a big issue. I think that's kind of what we're trying to get at to say, guys, I think there is not just a monetary premium or a value premium, there's a predictability premium that you should really focus on when you're doing this. And I love it. That was kind of the emphasis. I love it. I love it. You know what's so funny is, Rama, I, um, in my other podcast, Window Treatments for Profit, I'm consistently talking to window treatment professionals, right? Yeah. So we're talking about, you're like, you know, 100-story building where you're furnishing all the things versus us, like we're going to do, you know, some roller shades in one of those sure. apartment units, right? Um, and the thing about it is, is that that conversation over there, so when you were dealing with, say, you know, uh, whether it's Rally or Hunter Douglas or Horizon or Graber. It's a specific brand. It's a specific blind. It's a specific product. What I call it is a commodity. Yeah. And what that means is that if I'm out there as a window treatment professional and I'm literally just saying, here is this commodity and here is the price that I want in exchange for it. Here's the money I want in exchange for it. Then I'm not selling the other value. And yeah. with a window treatment product that is as a hard treatment, so literally shoppable, I'm always saying to them, you've got to get out of the commodity sale. And this is exactly what you're talking about on a much larger scale. You're talking about, that's amazing that that other firm over there gave you this design for the hundred story building and it's beautiful. But when's the last time they finished on time on budget? Have you called the people they've done business with, right? Like Exactly. I think it also goes to, I think that's an extreme example of big building, but even almost every project I was in, we're doing a house in Montana. You know, it's, it's actually somebody I know. And they, they were talking about, oh, you know, it's so difficult to get stuff there done, et cetera. I said, again, not for us. And so it's because it's, it's what supply chains are tapping into, what resources you have. And so once they understood what we could do, they're like, yeah, this is exactly what we want. And so I think it's, you know, it's, it's where you're focusing on your business. 
and what it is I think you're imparting. I think once, because unfortunately, the only way otherwise people realize it is after the project is over. They're like, oh, mm-hmm. that was a disaster. And we've heard many stories like this. So I think for us, I think it's been kind of upfront, explain to folks, it's almost been, make them make a decision and say, okay, I don't mind taking a chance. All right. If that's a decision you want mm-hmm. to make, I can't help you. But when it does have an issue, and again, I was last week, I was uh, looking at a penthouse in, I could say Nashville. That's okay. I guess Nashville. And they really had a beautiful design done very well by a very well-known designer, um, you know, who's famous and does all the celebrity things. But it really was not practical in the sense that it wasn't engineered. It was drawn. Mm. So it, it was kind of this very marble clad, you know, thing that was really cool. But if, if executed as drawn would be a disaster because it wouldn't function in the long run. It just mm-hmm. wouldn't work. And so, you know, right now the factories, they're engineering it and they're kind of understand how, how heavy does it have to be? What can we do to make this the right way? And, and so that is, again, going back to being predictable because when, the, when it comes here, I want to come here, install with no headaches. Right. I don't want to just slap something in and make a mess of this. And f- we're still talking and they're having trouble understanding and they're like, guys, and now they're like, yeah, I get what you're saying. I mean, you could just do it. And then get a bad reputation, they'll never call you again. Pay the consequences, and, But up right? front, I think if you're honest about it, and if people still decide to go a different direction, at least, I think you made your point. And I think, I think yeah. staying with that and actually executing it over the years, I think you establish a reputation. I mean, we will refer to this client because somebody will work with, in a similar project, says, hey, work with these guys, they execute and they show up. And so I think we're trying to build on that. We're also kind of, working with companies who think the same way. So even our vendors and our manufacturers, you know, it's the same mindset. Uh, when we sometimes we talk about, there's a lot of family owned companies. We're talking to the manufacturers and saying, guys, again, we've done this for 25 years together. And especially when times are not good, those values come to the surface and you're able to kind of get through those times just because you've had this experience and you've kind of demonstrated this ability to perform. And be predictable. And so it's, right. I mean, as much as a romantic part of design, which is fantastic, I think you can add some predictability to it and reliability. I think that's where the premium is at. I think that's I where love it is. Well. I love it. So I have a couple of questions for you in there. The first is, well, one is an observation because sure. you were talking about um, when you're now talking with somebody and you're like, okay, so their, their budget came in less, but I have a predictable track record of finishing not only on budget, but on time. And what I've learned, like from interviews with Brad Levitt, who is a luxury builder in Arizona, Rama, and he has said, any time a project goes over time, like one month of over of past due time at his level is costing anywhere from eighteen fifteen thousand dollars a month. Yeah. So the funny thing is, is in that regard, another company that their original budget that was approved might have been lower than your budget that you submitted. But if they finish three months late, now they're not finishing on budget anyway, right? And that's what you have to work as a designer and as a firm to expose when you're pitching your company for projects, right, Rama? Exactly. And I think that's where, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, a more mature, you know, developer contractor, like you're mentioning, understands that up front. They're like, yeah, yeah, it's great. But part of it is it needs to be predictable, it needs to show up on time, it needs to be executed. And I think that's why even on the development side or the contractor side, you see people who are successful, understand that, because that's why they are successful. You know, they're able to understand the fact that, you know, if you're finishing on time, you show up on time, everything is better. And uh, just from the with today's interest rates, I mean, the carry cost on projects. Mm-hmm. If it was 18000 before, it would be twice as much today just because of, you know, the high interest rates. So, and, you know, labor costs and, and you know, it's just unpredictability with time. But with, I mean, there's so many things that are changing that you want as much predictability as possible because there's so many variables out there. So right. I think as much, you know, as you can be predictable, I think the more chance of success. And that's mm-hmm. kind of what and, we're pitching with people. 
And the predictability from your viewpoint, it sounds like to me, you haven't said it point blank, but I'm inferring it, is your back end operations are locked down. Right. He's like, yes, <laughs> you got to see his face, guys. No, he goes, yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I think it's predicting the, I think it is getting the right staff. Yeah. Right. And also the right vendors and kind of going through a process of picking the right people. And I think creating a team and then testing them and then, you know, following through and just making sure that, you know, all the ducks in a row. Cause I think that's, that's my job. You know, I have, we have designers on staff who do the actual design and drawing, but I have to make sure our back end is solid. Exactly. Exactly. I love it. Now, the other thing that I wanted to go back to is that you mentioned that, you know, the sub, like this project in Montana, Montana and the uh, client out there is saying, we can't get anything. Everything's a nightmare. And you're like, yeah. not for us. Yeah. So, so where is, I, I, I realize you just mentioned how you're in charge of the back end and you're seeing to all of those nuts and bolts. And I'm sure that's one of your things as well um, in your role. And the company is making sure that you are using suppliers that are reliable. But how do you do that, Rama? Because if, if it was easy, nobody would be complaining about supply chain well, situations. I think, you know, part of it is developing relationships over the years. I think we have okay. personal relationships. So most of our suppliers are in Italy or in Pennsylvania. Uh, we have a few in Germany, but it's going there frequently. I'm traveling every three months, uh, at least every three months overseas. And, you're, and it's just sitting down with people and really understanding their, their position in the industry and spending a lot of time. And over the years, being a consistent, as much as I want a consistent supplier, they need a consistent client. So I think mm. even on our end, you know, even our staff presenting things to the manufacturer that are clear, uh, you know, taking drawings and doing shop drawings that make sense. Because just as much as, you know, we complain about a manufacturer, talk to the manufacturers, they have a lot of complaints. They say, hey, people don't, you know, give us drawings the way we need them. They don't do it on time. They don't mm. make decisions on time. So all of that causes headaches and deliveries for them. So their projects become less profitable if you're not if your back office is not functioning well. So they're less aggressive with making sure you're happy. So I think it's kind of a two-way street. I think if you kind of treat them the way you want to be treated, they then realize over the years that, okay, these guys are great. Uh, you know, they do what we need and they kind of work with us. And you kind of develop that trust over the years. So if you do have something that's urgent, they get it. Like I had my developer call me or my manufacturer call me yesterday and said, hey, I have three containers. Can you get it out of my warehouse before August shut down? Because they August shut down in Italy. So I call mm -hmm. you know, a developer or, or GC and, you know, and, and say, hey, do you mind taking these? And they're like, okay, I can take two. All right. <laughs> so can you, we'll take two, just put them on a slow boat. He's like, fine. Thanks a lot. So <laughs> at least, I mean, there's a little, it's just saying, well, according to a contract, it says this. You know, that, whereas it's just, it doesn't take much to kind of keep them happy. Like, okay, we're somebody that we can work with. And we kind of feel like if there's somebody we can work with, there's many times we're saying, can we get this faster? And so our client says, we picked you because you can do things like that. And you're willing to go down there and talk to them. And I think it's kind of a two-way street. And over the years, you develop a really good team. And the folks who don't perform, you don't work with again. And the right. people who do, you kind of stir as much business as you can to them. I love that what you said in there, and I want to emphasize it. I want everybody to hear it because a little part of what you said was showing up for them, showing up for the vendor in, and what you said was like you related to, to the drawings. If you're giving your drawings and you're giving the specifications in the way they need it, then that makes it more efficient on their end because they're going to ask you if you don't do it in the way they need it, they'll ask you for a revision. They'll ask you what this means. They'll do all of that. That, that vendor would do all that. But the more often you show up and honor their process, then their process goes faster and they know that working with you is more efficient and ultimately profitable for them because you're a reliable, consistent customer, a client of theirs. I like that because, again, I can relate it to window treatments. 
Yep. I mean, take it all the way down. I'm like needing a specification from an interior designer for the window treatment. And one designer will give me, you know, direction over the course of six emails, like stream of consciousness on, you know, what they want executed. And another firm will put it all together in a document. Here's the room. Here's the picture. Here's the picture of the fabric. This is the, the, the direction we want. Like it's night and day. Now I'm going to work with both designers and as individuals humans on the planet. I love them yes. all. But yes, there's there's some firms that we're just able to be in our lane and it goes smoother. And some firms were like, okay, hold their hand on this one, right? Yep. It takes you more time. It costs you more labor. Yeah. I mean, right. So, and, and so I really think of understanding what they, how they want to present it. And also I think even when we're talking to our designers or our clients, we understand what the manufacturer what their capabilities are. So even at the outset, you're kind of trying to talk to your clients to understand this makes more sense. It stir them in a direction that's more <laughs> manufacturable, that's right. easier so that you don't have to do 20 revisions. And so when you present it to your manufacturer, it's already kind of thought through and you've already made certain revisions with your client and your designers so that it is something they're happy to make and they can and they know they can do it. Because the other example, they will tell you, they will show you the products. They say, look at this. How can I make this? This guy took a photograph of this and is sending it to me. And it, it, it's, it's, they haven't bothered to do the work to understand exactly where do we get this? How is this? I mean, so I think, you know, I think it's part of that, I think, is really important to create a loyal, not just a client base, but also a loyal vendor base. Yeah, no, I agree. You're right, because we will all you know, within reason, we'll all work with whoever comes through the front door as a vendor, right? You know what I mean? Um, However, it's never lost on who makes our lives easier and who makes it more difficult. And when you are needing to get product to Montana and everybody else is having a hard time, your vendors know that you're reliable and you're predictable. And they'll, like you said, they'll take your phone call and do things for you that maybe are a little bit extra because you're valuable to them. Right, Rama? Yep. And I think also during the pandemic, this got exaggerated. Mm. So where you had say supply chains were down 20%. Well, 80% was still getting done. So which 80% was the question at the end? So if you could get in somebody, couldn't it's because your vendor thought, okay, these guys have been with you a long time. They do a good job. I want to keep them. I want to make sure they stay around. And I think even their vendors to them, their raw material suppliers had the same instincts. So if you have an integrated system from beginning to end of folks who are reliable and people who like to work with each other because they're they care for each other the whole system was a lot smoother and during a pandemic when we had these huge disruptions we were still consistently on time because our entire supply chain kind of was thinking the same way right it's so it's it's i love what you're talking about it just makes so much sense um and you know the pandemic was you know, I always, I've I've done several episodes over the years on recessions, yeah, and how to um, prepare for them and how to you know weather them and all the things. And one of the things that I've noticed in all the different types of business downturns that we've been through in our four decades is that the recessions, I always say, weed out the pretenders, right? The people who are just in business despite themselves that, they, yeah. <laughs> you know, when times are good and the economy is flying, there's there's business and there's more than enough for everybody. But when the going gets tough, and even though the pandemic was a, a fire hose of business. It was a difficult time to do business in. And so it was a different challenge. The challenge wasn't, was, wasn't, let me try and keep clients. Let me try and keep doing business. But to your point, if you didn't have a good system and you don't have the respect of the different vendors and you don't have the ones that you are, have developed relationships with, it probably was even harder for you, despite the fact that it was a fire hose of business, right? Rama? Yeah. I think also during the last recession around 07, 08, it was mm-hmm. kind of the opposite where we've had clients right. who said, Hey, are you dying out there? I'm like, yeah, good. guess what? I have this. You've never done this, but you should take a look at it. We did 400 sliding glass doors and wardrobes for a hotel. Wow. We're like, okay, let's try. It worked out great. Cause yeah, cause I know you can do it. Just spend some time. So 
you even found the fact that your client is socially reliable in one aspect, they kind of gave you business in the other aspect. Because yes. you're like, hey, you know, we want you, your team, your team is doing. So you can look at this. And we actually found some great vendors who looked at it, and we still do them now. And so mm-hmm. it kind of, I think it, I think if you can establish that of being reliable and being consistent and being predictable, I think not just you get vendors who want to come and work with you, even clients will actually find things for you. They're like, let me find this for you. And, you know, we're right now working on a, a private club in Miami, you know, something we haven't done really, but it's like, we, we want you to come and work on. So it's, so it's interesting because I think it kind of accentuates every time you have a little bit of a crisis, I think to your point, it does kind of make people relook at what they're using and say, you know what, let me, I think this is better than what we've been doing in the past. Right. So it is an opportunity yeah. as much as it's a, it can be a setback. Oh, right. It's always, there's always lessons in the challenges, yeah. right? It's oh, yeah. things that, you know, like you said, if you're thinking out of the box on products and services that you hadn't offered before, yeah. or if you're just understanding your value in the marketplace, what your, you know, unique, uh, you know, your USP is like for you, it's predictability and reliability in addition to the design, right? Yep. Um, but that's the thing. Like, it's like what we say in the show all the time. I expect the designer to create a beautiful room and yeah. I can keep going through Instagram and through websites to find somebody that based on their portfolio, I expect it to be a beautiful room. What I want though is the designer and the firm that's going to do it seamlessly. Yeah. That's going to make it as be- a good experience as I can possibly have. I don't expect there not to be problems. That's okay. Problems are okay. It's how do you handle them, right? Yeah. And we say the same thing to our clients here. We tell them, we're going to have problems. That's just normal. It's it's how we respond to it that's important. Yeah. And so I think that's where sometimes even some clients, we focus on those aspects of it, of talking to the last few clients. Can, can these guys perform? Are they reliable? Are they predictable? Are they going to show up on time? I think all those other features to me outweighs, I think many times, because even we were designing spaces for folks or working with designers and a homeowner, the homeowner is guiding a lot of the design principles because it is their home. Mm. And so we have to be good listeners and be good resources and find things. But I do think a lot of it is being driven by them for the ultimate outcome. So I think our job tends to be really kind of understanding, you know, how do we get your product on time, on budget, getting it to people. And I think that is just sometimes overlooked and even, when we're talking to designers, you know, when they present with designs, sometimes people think it's rude. It's, it's just being, not being rude. It's just being honest and saying, what you're doing here is going to lead to issues. How about right. doing it this way? And a lot of times people don't want to say that. And they're not going to say it. They're going to disappoint the client at the end. At the end, they will not be happy. Just because you at out front didn't really point out what the difficulties are going to be, they're not going to get hurt at the end. At the end, right. they're going to say, nope, that was a bad experience. I don't like the way it looks. So I think we've learned over the years, you, even sometimes you may lose a job because somebody may think, you know, you're being a little too opinionated on something. But I think if you get it out there and it, it's not going to help you in the long run just because you didn't spell it out up front. So I think you spell it out and make sure people are kind of in a mode where everybody can succeed. And then it's a great job. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Years ago, I did an interview with Lee Cockrell Rama, and he was the um, EVP of Worldwide uh, Disney Operations. Wow. And he was heavily involved in customer service and customer care and, and the vision for that, for the direction of the company. And he said, when you're not willing to have the hard conversation everything you goes have the hard conversation and everything else gets easier yeah. have, avoid the hard conversation you know avoid, have the only the easy conversation and everything else gets harder right and that's yep. what you're saying it's like yeah. if you with your experience your knowledge your expertise as a designer as a project lead as whatever your role is in a firm if you know that something that you're looking and talking about now is headed for a left turn say it now because you are yeah. not saving anybody any trouble right Exactly. I think this is exactly where we're at in one of the projects we're looking at right now. We're, I don't want to be the mean person in the room, but I'm just being honest, guys. We've done this for 25 years. Right. And can we try? No, it, it's not because we don't want to. We get paid right. if, we get, if we sign a contract. Yeah. But it's just, you know, it's, I mean, I used to be a surgeon in my previous life. 
And I think wow. one of the things you learned in the medical, it was, the same, it was kind of being that honest and upfront, set expectations where they should be, and everything else is easier after that. Yeah, it's so true. So, it's so true. In my, we have sales meetings at Window Works every Monday, and I'm li- literally, I would say at least twice a month, I'm saying no is a valid word. No is a valid oh, yeah. word. <laughs> and it's a good word sometimes. Even when, when somebody else, even a client says no to you, that's great because right. they're not wasting their time, they're not wasting yours, and, and life goes on. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. in between and, and having expectations that are not true, it doesn't get better. It no. just doesn't. So just set it out there, get it out there, and get it out there. And I think what it is too, Rama, is that we have to stand in the confidence of we are the expert in the yeah. room. You know, as the design firm, as whether it's yourself or someone on your team, when they're conversing with the potential client or existing client, it's that's exactly what they're coming there for. Yeah. Like if I want pie in the sky or I think it could happen, I could ask my mother about the design, but I'm paying you, right? Exactly. And I think if it's, I think, and then you will find those clients who get it are great yeah. and the ones who didn't you never wanted right because it's, it's they're going to have these impossible things that you can't execute and it's just a battle all the way through and i think there's something yeah. we learned early you know there's that aim to please when you start yeah. and you want to say yes to everything which is great uh but it, it's just get it out there and yeah. be honest and i think you in you'll the, find in out that it's better end. off yeah, yeah, bite you in the butt. Always. And I, I always say, my, my line that I always use in every, you know, almost every hard conversation that I have to really just say, I'm sorry, I know this to be true. You know, I say, in my experience, yeah. right? Because you're not going to debate my experience, in exactly. my whether it's my experience as a mother, as a wife, as a business owner, as a window treatment professional, as a podcaster. You know, it's in my experience, this is not going to turn out in the way that you're hoping. I, you know, I've seen this before and this is what is the result. Oh, well, but I want it to be the same. Well, that's awesome. But in my experience, that isn't likely to happen. <laughs> like I tell people when I was, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut. Like, you know, I'm not. So there you go. It's like, you know, it's, it's a lot of wishes. Great. I like, want that too. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like whatever, whatever cares whatever. what you want. Right. <laughs> but this was yeah. possible. And so, I think if you, like you said, if you have that hard conversation, I think it's all part of the same thing on making your project more predictable, not having these pie in the sky. I mean, kind of, I think you start, you know, I think with your clients, your vendors, your staff, and when you do your work, you do your due diligence and you work as hard as you can and you have resources. But at the same time, I think you have to manage both sides. So at the end, it's done on time and right. everybody's happy. And we find people who are thrilled when it's done on time as they expected. Initially, they may have thought, oh, you're a little too opinionated. But at the end, they were like, it's done. Yeah. And yeah, every single yeah. time it's done on time, on budget, you're their favorite person. Well, I think that probably the the largest majority of your clients, even I think, I think, look, are there some people that might have that knee jerk reaction of he's a little tough or he's an opinionated? But I think most people just actually, you're talking about luxury consumers here. We're not talking about you know the room design for that's a, a three thousand dollar. You know, almost every yeah. design project literally by definition is luxury. And so regardless of the level, but, but it's certainly at your level. And it just seems to me that I think most rational people, even though it might hit them a little bit like, oh, that was a little blunt or that was a little direct or whatever. It's ultimately like, but that's what I'm here for. I'm here yeah. for this expert advice, by the way. And even if they don't get it in the moment, I'm sure once your projects are done, they're they're delivered on time, on budget, and they are beautiful. It's like, oh, right. They were the leaders through this project. They actually could see the things four steps ahead. The predictability was there. They they knew where we yeah. were going and they and guided us I think us what there, we find right? is also with clients is, and I tell my team sometimes at the first meeting, they're like, oh, this person is crazy. I go, no, no, don't say that. Just point it out to them. Usually the first time around, second, third, by the time you get to the fourth meeting, they begin to understand, yeah, yeah. these guys yeah. are actually correct. I think... Because you always start off with usually almost everyone, you're like, whoa. But then you just kind of go through the meeting and you kind of, and I think once you kind of logically point each thing out, they eventually like, yeah, I see what you're saying. But I, don't, right. I do think people would get a little offended if you just, you know, without studying it and spending some time, you just look at it and go, oh, not possible. I think that comes right. across as being a bit arrogant. But I think if you just kind of take a little time and really study it and point out to people why 
this is right. not making sense. And they're like, got it. And I think then you do got get it. in buy-in. And then people begin to trust you to say, okay, these two are just, it's not an opinion, but it's actually based on some facts. Exactly. And so after exactly. the first meeting, I was like, oh, don't, don't freak out. Just, just let's look at a few more. Let's just work through the process and show them what's possible versus what they want and see if that makes sense. And exactly. once people begin to understand why you're saying it, they're like, yeah, this makes sense, what they're saying. Yeah, so I yeah. do think there's a little bit of art and kind of steering them into your direction too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We're still salesmen all day long. Yeah, like, exactly. Let's be serious. Yep. No question about it. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so another thing that you said early that I wanted to go back to was that you said we are always working on attempting, you want working with companies that think like us, that, and you went on to describe that have your values and that have the same things that you, you know, the, you want the same outcomes. Yep. Um, so as far as your vendors and so forth like that, and probably I'm sure that that extends to who you select to do projects with as yeah. well. And so do you have some advice for um, different things that when you are in that vetting process that go through your mind on when you're trying to figure out if a particular potential developer or client or vendor is going to line up with your company as far as values and customer service and all of that. I think one thing, so developers, for example, I think developers are, I think talking to the whole team, trying to understand, do they understand where you're coming from? And also, fortunately, I think being in the industry long enough, talking to other folks in the industry who work with the same group of developers or contractors to kind of understand what their experience has been. Why is somebody coming to you? Uh, are they owner-driven? Are they contractor-driven? Or is it a project-driven mm-hmm. thing? And do they understand it? And I think if you could s- and spend some time talking to them. And for your vendors, I think frequently visiting your vendors and really understanding their entire operation and who their key people mm-hmm. are and what drives them, what motivates them. And do they visit you often? Do they want to mm. understand what's happening in your project? Do they want to come and look at it? Do they want to, do they take pride in what they're doing? We had one of our vendors came in from Italy uh, three weeks ago who does some really great high-end closets. And we did this penthouse here in Chicago. And he just, you could see in his face, he was so excited. And he's the owner, his third generation. But he loved it. You know, he's taking videos of the, you know, the process. And you could really see was, Wow. Was genuinely excited that you know that his product was in this building in this unit in the United States in Chicago. I think those are the vendors you want because I think most mm-hmm. of my vendors, when we have a little discussion on quality or you know if you, if you get technical and say, "Well, this is not good, that's not good," and usually at the end you take a picture and you say, "Are you proud of this?" They're like, "Okay, fine, we'll redo it for you." Okay, mm-hmm. that's the vendor you want. So it says, "Which." I mean, does this, are you proud of this? I understand you could technically say there's a lot of things you could say. Just, well, you know, we could this, this, but like your name is on this. They're like, got it. We'll change it. You know, it. So I think those vendors are the ones you keep. And I think over a period of time, you develop them. But it does take effort and work and going and visiting and talking to them and spending time and spending personal time and having them come here and sitting, going out for dinner and, you know, visiting the whole family and kind of understanding what takes. What makes them tick and who their, you know, personal, like what do they do and who their key people are and how do they treat them and how do they feel? And I think it's kind of a whole family approach almost. That's interesting that you, you've mentioned that a couple of times, taking the time to go visit them. And, you know, you're not talking about from one side of Chicago to another. You're no. talking about going to different countries. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so for but for a lot of us, it could be just going to the other side of Chicago and visiting, you know, our tile person or our cabinet maker or our window treatment person. Right. Um, but for you and your business. That's like a line item that it sounds yeah. like. This is a line item. We're going to allow X amount of time for Rama to travel each year, yeah. not only to probably source and, you know, learn about product and innovation in product, but you're investing in the relationship with these vendors. Oh, That's it's what super it's, important getting. because, you know, they mm-hmm. have to be able to put it, you know, a uh, face with a name, a project. Mm-hmm. They have to say it's for so-and-so. They'll tell you, oh, it's just for so-and-so. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, we love when you come down. So I think it's, because at the end of the day, it's, it is human beings, and human beings can decide 
to pay more attention or less attention. They can decide to work harder for you mm, or not as hard. You're so right. Right? I mean, so if, they, <laughs> if there's a good relationship, they're like, oh, I was telling my developer, one of my developers in Nashville, I was there three weeks ago, I said, hey, I want to come down and sit down here and have a glass of bourbon with you again like we are now. That's what I, so I, I don't want to, you know, we're in our third building together and that's what we want to be able to do. And I think, I think it's the same thing with vendors. I think guys who are good feel the same way. They want to be happy when you, you know, you want to be happy when you see them. They want to have to see you. So I think getting a good relationship with your clients and your vendors is key. And we actually do events where we'll have our clients meet our vendors. We'll do events in the showroom where, you know, because even they get a really a kick out of meeting the ultimate person who's using their product and mm. kind of really generate, you know, kind of a goodwill across the board. So when it. you can tell them, hey, you remember you met that, my friend? Well, he has this problem. And they're like, okay, got it. You know, and because now it's not something in the abstract. It's wow. actually personalized to somebody. You're so right about that. I mean, you know? again, what's interesting is that you've taken um, basically – the qualities of your typical mom and pop shop of why that business is important in a community. And you've taken those exact same principles and put it on the global scale that your business lives on. Right. I mean, well, that's I think exactly everybody what I'm thinks the same though, at the end of the right. day. So it's not any <laughs> Humans, different. You, whether encounter, they're in Italy or Jersey, you know, right? when I first went to Italy, I'd sit down and say, can we get this done? And they'd say, can we have lunch first? And you're like, okay. This yeah, is important right. now. Now, you got, okay, let's start with lunch. So I think people do want to enjoy what they're doing, work with people they mm-hmm. like, and work for people they like. Yeah. I think the, yeah. as it's the so world true. gets bigger, it gets smaller. Yeah. Everyone listening knows whether they're talking about their vendor relationship or if, if it's an interior designer thinking about if they've got five different projects going on at one time right now. And it comes down to, Whatever, whatever your back is against the wall on, like the painter has to be at two projects at the same day. Well, who gets the the pick? Like, come on. Like, it's human nature, right? Like, you know, the one that has been consistently a good human to you all the way through is kind of, I'm sorry, the painter can't be at your house today. They're going to, you know what I mean? Like that one is off the list. (laughs) Yeah, I think the one you're happy to see, happy to work with is the one you will. That's it. Yeah, I mean, we want to deliver the ex- the same level of service to every th- everyone all the time. But what you're saying is, push come to shove, the relationship is going to impact all of what happens exactly. in the business. And I, so mm-hmm. I think your clients, depending, I mean, they may not realize it, but they depend on the relationship you've created. Right. Right? So it's yeah. not apparent, but actually it impacts them. Yes, yes. So. And that's where <laughs> when you go and you're in the, like, where we to bring us to back to the top of the interview where you when you're in there pitching and it's trying to explain to a client why, why they should select you and you're talking about the predictability and how that is valuable because I have a track record of delivering on time on budget of de- delivering beautiful things and you're probably I can imagine you and your team are also talking to all of your potential clients saying and we have solid relationships that are going to come through for us this yeah. is a thing that's a, it's a pillar in your business right yeah but I think when we do that's why we do events with our vendors and they're here we do it with our clients so that people realize that you know i was at a meeting i remember 15 years ago at a developer and they were trying to understand between one of the brands we carry snidero an italian brand and another brand and we were at a meeting i go i go here here's mrs snidero right next to me <laughs> this is it there was nobody else who has to make a decision just both of us and the developer's like yep got it got it you know so it makes sense because i think the bureaucracy what they were encountering elsewhere and they're like oh just you two guys said yep just us so I think yeah, those type of yeah, things yeah, do yeah. bring it home to people yes. that, okay, we understand why this can be more efficient. And like you said before, there's going to be problems always. The question is, how can you solve them? Can you do it aggressively? Do you have the relationships to be able to execute? And make right. something, again, going back to being predictable on time, on budget versus, you know, I think uh, taking a shot online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, and that's the thing. It's like, again, you run a a, a major company and you do these huge projects, but everything you're talking about actually 
like I said a moment ago, you're taking the principles from a little mom and pop shop and and making sure that you don't lose sight of those at yeah. this international level. But for all of us that run small businesses, it's just get back to basics, right? It's just like yeah. really hone in on the things that create a business and create the relationships with everybody that in, in that touches that business, right? Yep, yeah, I think I think for the first the last person exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. I love it. I absolutely love it. This has been such a delightful conversation, Rama. I mean, just so fun and so eye opening. Um, and just, um, it, there's nothing more satisfying actually for me is when I learn exactly that I learned that regardless of how large you scale your company and your firm, that it is always the core things that make a business successful, that they don't change. They do not change. You have to stick to those things. And that's what really continues and creates that sustainable success, right? No, I think so. Because there is a lot of, you know, picking up a phone and making a phone call that you can transmit so much more than sending an email. (laughs) But to have somebody (laughs) receiving it the other end, you know, who gets the history will work together it's i think without that it kind of you know we're going to have ai running everything right so yeah, yeah. Uh, well now you sound like my husband i swear <laughs> to goodness almost every monday he's like um you know somebody will be like well have you emailed that customer to follow up to see if <sighs> he's like have you picked up the phone pick up the phone please yeah. pick up the phone and call them <laughs> you can get so much more done Right. So true. Oh my goodness. Well, this was awesome. I'm sorry. You know, I was in Chicago last week. Ah. So if we had had this interview either next week, like the week before or whatever, I could have come in and said hello. So (laughs) I definitely will. Thank you so much for joining us. I do appreciate your insights. They've been very helpful, Rama. Thank you. Thank you. Had a great time. Thanks. When I first learned about Rama and I started reading about him, I expected to enjoy my conversation with him. I did. But I'm so happy and delighted that it turned into something else, right? I assumed that the the predictability conversation was going to be on predictability in your process and all of that, which is essential and crucial to running a well-designed business. But what I didn't know is that the conversation was going to run so much deeper into integrity into relationship building, and the value of having tough conversations. I mean, we're talking my love languages here, aren't we? (laughs) Right? So he talked about since the start of the pandemic, we've all experienced ups and downs with supply chain and wait times and all of that. All of the things that were out of our control. And focusing on things that are out of our control isn't often productive. So we need to and should focus on what we can control. And that's why I absolutely loved it when I asked Rama how he secures better suppliers. His answer was to be a better customer. I love this. Okay. It's like I always say, when we enter a tough conversation or a tough situation, We have to look back. We have to rewind it all the way to the place where we can identify the thing that we personally could have done differently. That's how we learn and that's how we know and we train ourselves to come up with better outcomes, okay? And it's really what Rama is doing and talking about here. He takes a proactive approach to making sure that his vendor partnerships are strong so that when there are issues that come up, His vendors want to go out of their way to help him. It's smart, and it absolutely aligns with my real-life business experience as well, okay? If you want people on your side, people who are going to advocate for you, people who want to go that extra mile for you, then you need to focus on what you bring to the relationship. And when you lay that groundwork early on, it absolutely makes sense that you're going to have great vendors and great suppliers because you've built those relationships and they have ensured that the partnership is strong, right? Rama told a story of working with a developer that 15 years ago, right? And the developer was trying to understand why he selected one of two different brands. And Rama turned and said, here, meet this owner of this brand. Okay, and that cleared everything up. The takeaway was that the owner, the company, the brand that shows up, that joins Rama, that supports him, that 
they actually have a relationship. It's not just a collaboration on paper. And when that developer saw that, he got it, right? It reminds me of Sandra Funk's Attitude is Gratitude parties. She hosts them every year, bringing together everyone in her circle, her clients, her employees, her vendors, her friends, the people who keep the wheels turning for her. And it's not only a great time, but it's an in-time real reminder that relationships matter. Showing appreciation, taking the time to build the human element, and connecting with others who can help each other. It's these little things that take a relationship from just another client or just another vendor to something deeper and more meaningful. And that's what starts to really set you apart in your business. A final takeaway I want to make sure to leave you with from this episode is Rama's emphasis on having those tough conversations, right? Building relationships isn't just about telling people what they want to hear, sugarcoating everything and staying positive. It's also about having the courage to have the conversations that need to be had. When Lee Cockrell was here, the former executive vice president at Disney, when he was on the show, him and I had a great conversation about handling tough conversations. And what was interesting is he pointed out to us, any of us that have kids, he said, you're willing to have a hard conversation with your child because you want them to get better. You won't shy away from that because you know that's how they get better. But he also said it's so often in our professional lives that we do shy away from these conversations. And then he said, you know, the line that I love that I've repeated a thousand times since I met him, when you only do easy things, life gets harder. But when you do the hard things, life gets easier. And I 100% agree. Nobody likes having a tough conversation. But if you can approach it with the understanding that this is ultimately for everyone's benefit, then it does not have to be a bad thing. You can get through it, you can preserve the relationship, and you can move on with everyone getting a little bit of what they need right? So thank you, Rama, so much. This was a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed it. I appreciate you too for showing up. Thank you so much. I hope I will see you in November in Orlando 2023. All right. Have a great day. Decide to be excellent. Thank you for joining me today. This podcast is a production of Luann Nigara, Inc. If you want to know more about me, my books, or Luann University, go to luannnigara.com. And if you are interested in having Window Works help you with your next window treatment or awning project in the New York, New Jersey metro area, go to windowworksnj.com to learn more. Have an excellent day.